you are a busy CEO, an executive, or maybe a passionate entrepreneur, you aren't carved out of the same stuff that others are, and that's what makes you successful. You work hard, but you understand that hard work is useless without the right strategy. You build high standards for yourself and others, and you are relentless in building your business. You're proud of the wins, and you've taken some great lessons from the losses. And yet, despite having standards, very high standards in many areas of life, you get up, you look in the mirror, and you see that image looking back at you. That when lined up with many other average people, you look the same. You have a dad bod, you're average looking at best, and more than likely, you might even be below average. Your energy waxes and wanes and your libido, when you're honest with yourself, is not even close to what it used to be. You feel confident in the boardroom, but you have had to do significant mental gymnastics to get clothing to cover up the muffin top. You try to have good posture because that's what hides the belly girth, right? Ouch. You just threw your back out. You see, it's estimated that over 70% of Americans sit in an overweight or obese category. Recently, it's actually been reported that 97% of Americans are considered metabolically unhealthy. To be average in America today, you are fatter by body fat percentage than a pig. To be average in America, you move less than 5,000 steps per day. You most likely have acid reflux or some sort of irritable bowel syndrome. Your back hurts, your legs cramp, your hair is thinning, and you can't seem to figure out why your metabolism continues to shrink. It must be age, right? Today's episode is titled, The CEO's Guide to Getting Lean, a Masterclass. If you find yourself experiencing any of the symptoms that I mentioned above, this episode is your starting point. Expect to learn why your wife or your girlfriend may be one of the most important people in your in your life and a determining factor of the success of your body. How trends, fads, and people claiming, quote, science are misleading you into thinking that it's all your fault. And how the food you're eating today, despite being packaged the same, is not the same as it was 10 years ago. All that and more on today's Evolved Man. Welcome to The Evolved Man, where we are at war with the mediocrity of modern man. The Evolved Man is for men like you who are willing to be strong, open, and aggressive learners. Men who are not afraid to disrupt and change. It's time we ditch the current conventional idea that we devolve with age, that the dad bod is our destiny, and that the glory days are behind us. Your best isn't behind you. And I'm here to provide you with practical tools, a few tips and tricks, and everyday wisdom to help you evolve into your highest form. Strong, lean, smart, educated, and emotionally intelligent. Now, let's go to war. Welcome back to the Evolved Man, where we are at war with the mediocrity of modern man. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Evolved Man 153. We're going to break up today's episode into a couple of sections. Section one is how a former writer and theologian's game theory can help you reframe your physical journey. And section two, the three phases you need to understand and why you need a different strategy for each when it comes to weight loss and body composition change. Before we jump in, I would love to keep this conversation going with you. Do me a favor, would you? Jump onto the evolvedmanpodcast.com and sign up for our newsletter where you'll get even more information on how to maximize your health and live in your most evolved body. Episode 153, The CEO's Guide to Getting Lean and Staying Lean, a masterclass. And now, Onto the show. 
One of the biggest mistakes I see people making is not taking into consideration known and unknown players in your life. Knowing that your wife or your girlfriend uh, thinks about you and what you're doing to get in shape is extremely important, but not in the way you may be thinking. You see, in his seminal work on game theory, James Cars describes some of the key differences between finite and infinite games. If there is one mistake, one thing that I had to point to when it comes to the failure people have relative to getting lean, building a body that looks great without clothes on, and staying fit in life, it's that they apply finite game theory to an infinite game. Let's discuss a couple of those mistakes and how they're made manifest in your life. First, Cars talks about how in infinite games, there are known and unknown players in the game. Let's use a business analogy to show how this works. You know that in business, if you have an employee who brings skills, talents, and abilities, they also bring effort to the table, and that skill, talent, ability, and effort brings a certain level of performance. He is your known player. Now, the unknown players in the infinite game of your business are all of the people that affect that employee. His spouse, family members, mentors, friends, and even the people on TV, social media, and people that he interacts with in any way, shape, or form are all unknown players in his life and then thus unknown players in your infinite game. So why? Why does it matter? Well, this matters because every person, whether they are a known player or an unknown player that you interact with and that your employee interacts with, or that they may be interacting with in the future, will have some sort of influence on the known player. Have you ever had a once shining star employee that suddenly taint in performance and eventually you end up parting ways with them? I recall one instance in my leadership experience where I had an employee who was a strong performer. He worked hard, he worked long hours, and the magic of his execution was that he spent time and had an overall presence that he commanded when he was in the space. There were, as with every person, gaps in his leadership skill set. He was not great at the accountability piece and having uh, sometimes those difficult conversations when his team wasn't performing. When he wasn't around, the team would relax their standards and he accepted it rather than coaching them to a higher level. Because he was in the office a lot, the gaps were relatively small. Again, the major problems happened when he was not around. Eventually, there was an unknown player that entered our infinite game of the business. He found someone he liked and he wanted to spend more time with. He would leave work early and use uh, where he used to spend a lot of time there. He now started making this new relationship outside of work a priority. This wasn't a problem. In fact, it was actually very healthy for him. The challenge was now that he was not in the office as often, working and watching over what I would, he's now doing normal hours and was not doing the extreme workload that he had previously done. It opened up for gaps in the overall performance. And this is where the problems rose. At this point, he had a few choices. You see, as his perf team's performance started to tank and the gaps that were present previously that were covered up by his time that he spent in, he could pause and make one of three choices. Choice number one is to continue to live a more balanced and healthy life with this new relationship and coach his team to get to the high standards that we had and make sure that they were held to those standards while he was out. Choice number two, continue to live a more balanced and healthy life with his new relationship and not change his coaching and accountability. Or choice number three, go back to working the ungodly hours and make up for his team's shortfalls. You see, the introduction of the unknown player changed the performance of the business and forced a decision tree that was not urgent before. Known and unknown known players affect us in the infinite game of health and fitness more than we realize. 
The spouse that says the new exercise routine isn't what her favorite internet internet doctor says is optimal might get in your way. The family at gatherings who talk about how you're, quote, too good for the food that they serve may be an obstacle. The work colleague who feels uncomfortable and teases you for how you eat and questions your new, quote, extreme way of living may be a hurdle. The butcher, who over time becomes one of the most interesting people you interact with and one of the best sources of information on how to prepare your food, may be an unknown player that eventually becomes someone who helps you to get to the level that you want to get to. The author who wrote the cookbook you started to read because you woke up to the fact that most food produced today is not really food, but a food product made out of cheap materials may be an interesting unknown player. The known and unknown players all make an impact on your life and your ability to change and grow. You see, when I work with my executive clients, we work together for no less than six months and preferably at least a year. I coach primarily male CEOs and executives over 40 to get in and stay in great shape. This enhances their overall life and takes their high standards that they have in business and applies them to the body. It's not really the body, though. It's overall their life, the way they think, the way they live, the way they feel, the way they interact with themselves and interact with others. The great thing is, as the standards rise, their bodies change. Over the years, the clients who have seen the best results are the clients who work with me longer, but not necessarily for the reason you may think. You see, Gull's Law states that a complex system started out as a uh, any complex system that works and functions appropriately is something that started out from a simple process and a simple system. And that all complex systems conceived at the beginning will fail. Complexity is built over time. The simple solution is a solution for right now while we build in complexity over time. When you start on a journey of building your health and fitness, you identify the known and potentially unknown players in your infinite game as a stepping stone, a starting point. It's only through experience that you truly understand who all of the known and unknown players are. This simple system has to become something that is more complex over time, but it cannot be complex at the beginning. As you progress through your goals and you work to achieve you will become more aware of the players in your life and how they affect you and your health and fitness. There will be several unknown players in this infinite game we call health and fitness and the infinite game of life that you will eventually become aware of. For instance, over two decades ago, I had no idea how lobbyists, politicians, and people in the commodities market affected and impacted my health in very significant ways. You see, in our economic system, the foods we eat today are not the same that they were yesterday. Our economic system is driven by supply and demand, and we're not driven by health. It's important to keep that in mind as we talk about some of these things. Your Coke, your Snickers, your Dryer's ice cream, your bread, your pasta, or any number of products you purchase today are not the same that they were even a decade ago. Now, when I started my career in health and fitness, I became aware of the massive prevalence of corn in our diet. Corn was cheap and partially because it was highly subsidized. Lobbyists, politicians, and the commodities market made corn the bell of the ball. And most food products were now shifting from being sweetened with cane sugar to being sweetened with high fructose corn syrup. So what is fructose? Fructose is just the name of the sugar that comes from fruit. It's the name of the sugar that's in your apple, in your cherry, your banana, your tomato. It's all sugar just by a different name. Now, high fructose corn syrup is essentially where fructose or sugar is taken from somewhere and infused with corn syrup, the delivery system. And it became the substitute for the former recipes that made your food taste the way that it did. This was done for economic reasons. Corn was cheap and corn syrup was easy to get. It was not done for health reasons. I don't believe that there is any point in time that in our economic system, previously 
right now or in the future where companies will be driven by pure health alone. Companies need to make money, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. The biggest challenge that we run into is how many of these unknown players and the decisions that they make affect you and your health. Now, this may not be your problem. This may not be something that you caused, but it is your responsibility. Let's move from corn, and as a side note, look at what's in your products today. Just about everything you eat is now laden with soy. Look at the labels. Your bread, your ice cream, your pasta, your chocolate, almost everything has some sort of soy in it. Soy is the newly crowned bell of the ball. The way you find it on the label, as a side note, is by looking not just for the word soy, but soy lectin. Walk through the aisles, pick it up, take a look at it. Now, guys, don't get me wrong. This is not a social media post where the quote-unquote expert is walking up and down the aisle telling you that everything there is garbage and you should be afraid of it. This is simply education so you understand that what you put in your mouth today is not the same as it was 10 years ago or even 20 years ago. Learning what your food is, understanding where it comes from, and understanding how it affects your body is critical to your overall health and the way that you will interact with life. Now, I have a few theories on uh, the long-term side effects of consuming the Frankenstein products in the supermarket, but we'll save that for another day. Throughout the years, my clients go on their health and fitness journey. The known and unknown players change, and we're able to discuss them and how they affect their progress. So what? What does that mean to you? Why does this matter? And so what do you do with it? Well, the first thing is to sit down and look at the people in your life and classify them into one of three court categories. For ease, I just steal the categories from Fred Reichelt's work of the ultimate question and is often used in the NPS or Net Promoter Score because this is a very common language we have in business. The first is promoters. True promoters are further up the path than you are on the health and fitness journey. And these are people whose gravitational pull alone will help you to promote a lifestyle that you're working towards. The guy who has been fit for years and comes up with crazy challenges for himself just to, quote, test himself, his life and actions alone promote your active evolution. Next are passives. Passives just like the NPS score, are just that, passive. They may be people who are significant or who are slightly ahead of you on the journey. They may be people at the same level of you on the health and fitness journey, or they may be behind you. You see, it's the trajectory that matters. The trajectory is what makes these people passive players in your life. Like passives in the classical NPS scoring, they will leave your life if something better comes along meaning that they will be on your side when they feel like it and not on your side when the winds change. This could be a spouse who works out but isn't very committed to it. She may encourage you from time to time, but if she's stagnant or up and down in her own journey, she may, quote, leave you on this progressive path depending on her own journey. Passives sometimes are difficult to identify. They're very difficult to identify in the short term, but it is easy to spot a passive if you look at how they live throughout the course of a year, three years, or even five years. Finally, you have detractors. Detractors are the people who are always on a diet. They're those people that complain about their weight, their health, or just simply complain in general. They make excuses like age, genetics, et cetera, for their body. And they are either openly or secretly digging at you as you work your way towards your life's evolution. Now, once you've identified your promoters, passives, and detractors, you probably already know the next step. Focus the majority of your time on the promoters. Spend as much time interacting with, learning from, and consuming what promoters create Spend as much time as possible with 
these people. You become what you focus on, and promoters will always be there to pull you into the inner circle that is the 1% of the health and fitness journey. Now, considering the statistically Americans now hold a higher percentage of body fat than the average pig, and roughly north of 70% of Americans are pushing towards the obese category, finding the promoters may be difficult. But when you do, when you find these diamonds in the rough, you will learn much more from them than you will them than you will learn from the passives and detractors. As a side note, I want to come back to something I referenced earlier regarding the game you're playing. The reason it's important to do the player exercise is because regardless of whether or not you realize it, your health and fitness journey is an infinite game, not a finite game. The goal of all infinite games is to keep the game going and to play it well. There is no start and stop. You see, in finite games, all the players are known. And so we started talking about known and unknown players because the game of the health and fitness journey is an infinite game. As I mentioned before, the mistake I see many people, and you may be shocked to know, especially. CEOs, top executives, entrepreneurs making, is that they're not recognizing the fact that health and longevity is an infinite game. You see, in your data-driven, metric-focused KPI uh, world, you drive towards a consistent result in a specific timeline, this quarter, the next 18 months, the five-year plan, et cetera, and you lose touch with the idea that there isn't an infinite game. Now let's pause for just a second and think about how you play an infinite game in business. Your branding, not your marketing, your logo, but your brand, what people think and feel about your business is the leading indicator in business of the infinite game. Coca-Cola knows this and has managed to create a strong feeling since the day they started in 1886. Even with that mistake back in the 80s, which we won't really go into today. The mission and the values of your company and your overall brand strategy plays into the concept of the infinite game because you know that people purchase from brands that make them feel a certain way. You drive a Mercedes because it evokes a symbol of status and refinement. You buy a Patek, because it's a feeling of quiet luxury. Your customers buy from you because they feel that they get quality, security, reliability, etc. To build the feelings, to establish the reputations, to solidify the brand takes time. In business, this is the infinite game. In life, your health and your fitness is the infinite game. But you have failed in the past when you have applied finite principles to an infinite game. Let's look at an almost epidemic level rise in this concept and what the hottest new drug is on the market. For some time, semaglutide has been used as a drug in the diabetic space and is now being used to help people lose weight. Part and parcel with the allopathic medicine community, this flawed framework is prevalent and becoming epidemic level in terms of how we are addressing the overweight and obese population. This flawed framework is that they see a problem, i.e. excess body fat, and they prescribe a drug. The flaw in the allopathic way of thinking is that the overfatness in America is something that can and should be treated with medicine. The flaw is the assumption that the root of the problem will actually be addressed by the drug. We won't go deeper into the way the drug works today, but I'll give a brief overview so you understand the flaw in this thinking. Essentially, the drug does a couple of things. Number one, it decreases the rate of gastric emptying, which essentially means that it takes longer for the food to get out of your gut and makes you feel full longer. Number two, it activates the stretch reflex or the full filling in the stomach causing you to feel full and thus eat less food. Obviously, there's more complexity to this that we won't go into today, but suffice it to say that the end result of these two factors alone is that people eat less. 
The drug does nothing to burn body fat. The drug does nothing to directly increase the metabolism and to burn off the stored body fat as fuel. It simply activates certain signals and pathways in the body to get you to eat less. Your habits only change while you are on the drug. What is happening chemically in your body is similar to what you see on these extreme unhealthy TV shows uh, for several years ago, and maybe they exist today. I guess I just don't watch enough television to know. But where they would take a group of extremely overweight people, sequester them, decrease their calories significantly, and work them out to a point of exhaustion. These biggest losers would stand on the scale at the end of their journey and be proud of the work they did. And then, 12 to 18 months later, they'd be at the same spot that they were prior to going on the show. Why? Well, the premise is simple. The lifestyle, habits, and mindset never really changed. They played a finite game. within the lab, they were able to lose weight. They lost weight in the lab type setting. When you're on this drug, you lose weight in the quote unquote lab setting. Doing this while you're removed from the infinite game of life creates an alternate reality that makes it difficult to replicate when quote real life comes back. This is the way the mental mechanism works and that causes former athletes to become overweight. They still eat the way they did when they were doing practice every day or two twice a day, and they play a game on the weekend. Sorry for the tangent. Let's go back to the drug. When you go on an extreme caloric restriction, which is what this drug does, you lose weight. Let's say, for instance, that you've lost 200, or you've gone from 250 pounds down to 220. When you're losing weight fast, you lose more lean tissue or muscle. Now, I know you know this, but I have to point it out that lean tissue or muscle is more metabolically active than fat tissue. This means that the more muscle you have, the better your metabolic rate will be, i.e. the more calories you will burn at rest when you work out, and get this, the more you will be able to eat and have greater flexibility with your diet. Remember, only 3% of Americans are metabolically healthy. A lot of that has to do with the amount of muscle that they don't have. Now, let's say for argument's sake that you are like most people I've seen come to me after having done this extreme finite game cycle of weight loss. You go from 250 to 220. What has happened is you may have lost 20 pounds of fat and 10 pounds of lean tissue. Now you're 30 pounds lighter, and you're at a greater risk for living for a while at a lower metabolism because you have shed 10 pounds of highly metabolic uh, tissue. You feel better for a moment, and then you go back to your normal lifestyle. You eat, quote, unquote, good for a while, but by and large, you go back to normal about a month later. And a month later, you're kind of eating like an asshole again, binging and beating up your body over and over. You're treating yourself with the same cycle of abuse. You gain back the 20 pounds, and hey, you're still 10 under your previous weight, right? Not too bad. You can maintain this, or can you? This is where the math gets really important. You see, when you gain the weight back, you are only gaining fat. The 20 pounds of fat you lost are now found, except your body has, at this new weight of 240 pounds, less metabolically active muscle tissue than it had at 250. You are now sitting 10 pounds lighter in lean, metabolically active muscle tissue. Fast forward a year, and you will probably be at about 250 pounds, now sitting with an extra 10 pounds of fat, and you are larger because fat is more voluminous than muscle. Now, I hate to say what I'm about to say, but I've actually heard from some of my elite, even Olympic-level, professional-level, championship-winning athletes and some of the smartest people that I've ever heard, uh, met. Very well-educated executives use the phrase, muscle weighs more than fat. No, a pound is a pound. However, a pound of muscle is more dense. Think 
lean filet that you get from the butcher. A pound of fat, however, is larger, more voluminous, bigger, more space. Now, in your journey of the infinite game, your finite game that you've been playing came back to bite you, and the difficulty of getting to a weight, look, and a feeling will increase because you now have more fat and less muscle to play with. Oh, and you still have the same poor mindset relative to your identity, your image, the same poor eating habits, and the same excuses that you had when you were playing the finite rules into your infinite game. So, what's the alternative? Well, you could do what many people do and jump on the latest bandwagon. I'm not sure what this will be five years from now, but I'm pretty sure that we've done it before. You see, right now, I'm seeing all over my social media feeds about this amazing thing called colostrum. Here's a side tangent. I know I'm doing a few of those today. Colostrum, which is the breast milk before the milk, is now in vogue again. Something that I haven't seen recycled in the fitness industry and the media for probably 15 or 20 years. There's no difference. It doesn't affect you any better today than it did 15 or 20 years ago when it was disproven to be an effective form of protein. But I digress. You could do whatever fad diet your neighbor is doing and start the, quote, let's destroy our metabolism and get ultra long-term fat process again in a different way. Or you could make the choice by starting to realize that you are living an infinite game. Let me give you an example of how some people without knowing it play the infinite game, but give credit to something that may not be true. If you or someone you have known has ever cut soda out of your diet and seen weight loss, this infinite game tactic is for you. Let's look at what happens. A typical 12-ounce soda has about 150 calories in it. I've never known anyone who drinks just one, so let's say that you're typically drinking at least two a day. That equates to about 300 calories per day. For baseline, it's been estimated that a pound of fat is 3,500 calories uh, when it's stored on the body. So in theory, you would take 3,500 calories to decrease that pound of fat. Now, I know I just told you something that you can find on the internet and it's easy to Google, but we have to start there so we're all on the same page. If you cut out soda with this habit alone, for 365 days, you've cut out 109,500 calories in a year. Assuming that that weight loss and metabolic health is linear, which it is not, that would equate to about 31 pounds of weight loss. Now, for clarity, weight loss and metabolic changes in the body, uh, there are some mechanisms built in to protect the body that prevent this linear drop if you're living in a society like we are where food is prevalent. So this scenario is not 100% accurate, but you get the picture. Instead of losing 31 pounds, you may only lose about 25. But again, you get the picture. Now, did you lose the weight because you cut out sugar? No, you lost the weight because you cut calories by putting yourself in a deficit. This practice is a great example of the infinite game. One of the things I teach all of my online clients is that the two most powerful forces in the universe are love and compounding interest. We'll talk love and how the power of loving yourself and removing harmful behaviors is far more effective uh, in the long term uh, for results than the, quote, kick your ass all the time. But again, that's for another day. Let's just look at the power of compounding. You know the power of compounding and compound interest is earned by those who understand it and paid by those who don't. It's no different in the infinite game of health and body fat loss. A small financial investment at the start, let's just say $100, with $100 invested monthly and compounded at a moderate 6%, will yield you just north of $19,000 at the end of 30 years. The compound effect creates roughly three times the variance in the future value versus the amount of capital invested. The same principle applies to your body. Simply changes compounded over time yield great results. Now, let me share a personal example of the power of compounding. 
And yes, before I tell you this story, I already know that I'm a bit of a nerd and more than a bit obsessed with playing the power of compounding in every, every area of my life. You see, a few years back, I had a habit that uh, I wanted to start, or excuse me, that I was already doing. I was hiking, and sometimes with my family. So I said to myself, what if I set a goal to do my age in number of push-ups every time I went on a hike, whether I'm by myself or with my family? I think I started this when I was about 42 or 43 years old, and I can honestly say it took a few pauses and several attempts to do the full 42 or 43 out on the trail and what I now call trail push-ups. The trail push-ups are there and something that I do on a regular basis because I want to set an example. You see, trail push-ups are not just a compound habit for me, but it's a way that I can show up as a leader in my family. As my kids age, excuse me, as my kids age, I want them to know that you can evolve through life. The dad bod or the mom bod is not your destiny, and through choice, you can live better with age. If my 18, 19, 23 uh, year olds are with me. The eight, they have to do 18, 19, or 23 push ups respectively, and they can see the old man crank out now 47. They can see the example of leadership. They can see the concept of how you do anything is how you do everything. From the point I started till now, I have worked up to build my overall strength and now cranking out 48, or excuse me, 47. I've moved myself to 48 because I'll be 48 in a few months. Push ups, it can be done in one go every time high energy days, moderate energy days, or low energy days. Over the years, I've become fascinated with testing limits as I go around the sun. And every, uh, excuse me, the other day I had a moment of clarity, inspiration, maybe just plain crazy thinking. I'll let you decide. As I was doing my pull-ups, I looked down at my first working set and something clicked. You see, I've been doing pull-ups for a few decades now, and the power of compounding hit me the other day. As I finished my set, I looked down and I had a 45-pound plate wrapped around my waist. But I'm 47 years old. I should be doing at least 47 pounds on my pull-ups, I said to myself. But when I put the two and a half pound plate on, it looked unbalanced to my artistic eye. Ah, 50 pounds sounds better anyway, I tell myself. So the second two and a half plate went on, and I went on to do the rest of my sets with 50 pounds around my waist. So now I have a new goal. Throughout the year, during the heavy lifting sessions of my periodized program, at least. More on that on another episode of how we periodize and work out to make sure that you have a full year plan. But during that time, I will do at least my age in the amount of weight strapped to my waist. Yes, I know that that means when I'm 100, I need to do 100 pounds around my waist. And I'm leaning into and relying on the power of compounding to help me get there. Because who wouldn't want a grandpa or a great-grandpa at that age holding that kind of weight? I think that's pretty cool. You see, when you shift the mindset from a finite game, finite timelines, and you stop playing the finite game, your health, your fitness, your performance starts to immediately improve. Because you make choices that now live in the infinite space. You stop justifying the thousands you spend on a car, wardrobe, house, etc. while complaining about the cost of good food or the price of investing in the right coaching. You start saying you, quote, deserve the treat and start realizing that with the right strategy, you can eat the food you want and get lean if you know how the power of metabolism works. As a side note, I did an experiment once on myself where I ate at least one donut per day while applying the principles I teach my clients about how to manage their metabolism, and I dropped about two percentage points of my body fat. 
I stopped at two percentage points because I simply got sick of eating donuts every day, which is kind of weird because I love donuts. But I digress. Taking on an infinite game mindset allows for flexibility because as the cheesy saying goes, the only constant in life is change. Playing the infinite game shifts the way you see your movement, your food, your body, and your strategy. Now, if you want to stay connected on this particular topic and others, do me a favor. Go to the evolvedmanpodcast.com and sign up for our newsletter where we can support you more and we can have more in-depth conversations on the power of metabolism and how important it is that you understand how it works so that you don't get led down paths that will help you to become fatter and fatter and unhealthier and unhealthier as you age. Now, if you think an executive level of coaching is right for you, go to the Evolve, uh, excuse me, go to my website, evolve-cast.com and click on the book a strategy call to see if you're ready to get started on a path of evolution. Now on to the next section. In this next section, I want to discuss the three phases that every healthy fit leader goes through. The three phases simply are, one, get in shape, two, stay in shape, and three, explore and experiment. Phase one is about getting in shape. If you, like most Americans, think you have about 10 to 15 pounds to lose, you are more likely in need of about 20 to 30 pounds of fat loss. Even if you've been exercising hard, you know you are not in your, quote, best shape. Well, what is shape? Let's define it for a moment. First, shape can be simply defined as the shape of your body. Sloping shoulders down to a rounded belly, uh, stick legs, small rectangular-looking lower body, stringy biceps, or a flat chest. No butt, rounded, bubble, uh, rounded belly, or maybe you have a bubble butt and a barrel chest. Whatever it is, there's an overall shape to your body that's either helping or hurting you. Psychological studies show that men who have developed a larger shoulder-to-waist ratio not only feel more confident, but are perceived as more confident, more commanding, and more trustworthy. The classic V taper is not just visually appealing, but it has significant ramifications to the health of the body as well. For instance, Fat in the midsection is recycled through the bloodstream in the form of triglycerides more than fat in the subcutaneous or under-the-skin areas. Your round belly puts your heart at greater risk and mechanically pulls your pelvis forward, putting excessive pressure on your lower back. Picture this in your mind. Imagine picking up a two-pound weight and holding it at your side all day long. It wouldn't hurt very much on the first day. You might be a little bit sore, but over time you'd adapt to it and you wouldn't feel the pressure as much. However, that two-pound weight in your hand would, over time, pull you mechanically to one side, developing a muscular imbalance, and lead to neck, shoulder, hip, back, and or knee pain. Now take that same analogy and imagine that you've got an extra 10 to 20 pounds of fat around your midsection and it's doing the same to your hips, thighs, and lower back. Your quote-unquote shape matters, not only physiologically, but mechanically. In another episode, we'll dive deeper into the concept of energy leakage, but know that at any time that your body is forced to carry extra fat that it doesn't need, it will adjust its posture. And by doing so, you will contract muscles that are not supposed to be contracting on a regular basis, and you will leak energy throughout the day from this modified posture. This is one of the major reasons overweight men with big bellies, have such low energy. It's not your testosterone. It's because you have put your body into a compromised position where you have leakages of energy because you're contracting to hold everything up. Again, this complex, or excuse me, this uh, content uh, concept is complex. And the fix for it is even more nuanced. So we're going to save the majority of that for a later date. Now let's talk about shape in your various systems. Often we refer to getting in shape as becoming more cardiovascularly fit. And that is part of it. The cardiorespiratory fitness and improving it is an important part to your, the overall shape that you are in. However, more and uh, 
excuse me, more often and more important systems that are missed are your neuromuscular systems and the shape that they are in and your digestive system and the shape that it is in. Getting in shape in this regard means that you have a strong digestive system and thus have boosted your immunity because the majority of your body's immune system lies in the gut. Getting in shape means you have health, strength, and mobility and a suppleness to soft tissue. Nerves fire and function appropriately and your muscles move in appropriate patterns. Previously, when I worked with clients in a gym setting, the number one thing that we had to do was fix improper firing patterns during certain movements. I'm working my shoulders hard every week, but they don't grow, I would hear from clients. After an assessment, we figured out that the prime movers or intended prime movers, which are the deltoid of the shoulder muscles, were being bullied during the movement by other phasic fibers that were primarily designed to support those prime movers. Once we restored proper movement patterns, the shoulder blew up in size and shape with much less effort than was happening before. The shape of your soft tissue is also relative to the ability to move through a proper range of motion without pain. If you wake up with constant back pain, constantly have to be careful of that bum knee or are always taking a couple of ibuprofen for that old football injury, you aren't in good shape relative to your soft tissue. Tender tissue is not healthy tissue. During the phase of getting in shape, you learn how to train all aspects. The cardiorespiratory shape with long muscular endurance and, or excuse me, long-term endurance and short-term power. The musculoskeletal and neuromuscular shape of improving tissue health, metabolism, and insulin sensitivity. You re, excuse me, you recomp your body by building lean tissue and eliminate excess fat tissue by building a better shape to your hormones and the delicate balance that is living within you. Getting in shape off also refers to the idea of getting in shape with your thoughts, feelings, and emotions and habits you have relative to your body, your movement, and your overall health and identity. While that discussion goes well beyond today's scope of the podcast, it's probably the most important component of getting in shape and staying in shape. If you're not addressing the shape of your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, and your habits relative to your body, your movement, and your overall health and identity, nothing will stick. Most people feel like they fail in phase two, which is staying in shape. And that's partially true. You see, when we go from phase one to phase two, our goal is I've lost this weight and now I want to, quote, keep it off. When they don't, they feel like they have failed. Now, if you've ever lost weight, built some muscle and gotten yourself into, quote, better shape and then gone backwards, you may be thinking you fall into the same category. My experience tells me something a little bit different. You see, getting into shape, as we defined above, is a much longer process. There is no 12-week program that will get you into the type of shape we've discussed. Some can do it in 12 months, but for many, it takes a couple of years. I know that's not what you want to hear today. In our get it now, fast food, door dash it to me society, but it's true. But take heart. You can see results quickly. It's just that the whole getting in shape in the way we described just like building your business, it takes time. And it takes a lot more time than you initially think. After taking the time to address the different aspects of getting in shape, each of the areas we discussed previously, you can now move on to that next phase. But if you're trying to stay in shape after a 12-week program, you're too early to the game. So let's say, for instance, that you've lost fat, gained strength. You look better and you have more healthy habits in your lifestyle. Your self-perception has evolved and you are in a different time frame. Once you get in shape, like literally get in shape, not the 12-week thing, but the 12-month plus thing, the clock starts ticking. The key during phase two is to move from the initiation of habits to the elevation of habits. And you need to maintain that fat loss for at least 18 months. 
Now, what I'm about to tell you, doctors, supplement companies, and people who push short-term weight loss solutions don't want you to know because it automatically makes you a forever non-customer to their services. When you stay lean for 18 months after getting in shape and getting it in the way that we discussed, you become metabolically different. Your new set points are improved. All of your health markers and fitness markers become more solid, and it takes a dramatic event to move you back into a more unhealthy state. When you do this, you are significantly more likely to maintain the new metabolic rate and stay lean for life. More on that in a future episode, but it goes because it goes beyond today's uh, episode. But I will tell you, anyone that has gotten themselves into great shape has maintained it for 18 months. They're able to maintain it for much longer. Now on to phase three. After the 18 month or so period, you're moving into what we call the explore and experiment phase. Obviously, this now becomes the lifelong phase, the lifelong exploration of what the new you can do. Now, from personal experience, I remember a time where as I was in this phase, I had an epiphany of sorts. I had spent a significant amount of time at this new level of strength and leanness and my mind opened up and I just started to feel the urge to do activities that made me feel more alive. Things that I previously didn't think I could do before. I started to take a paragliding lessons. While my physical shape didn't need to change in order to learn how to fly, my mind did. It was only after being in better shape overall, as I'd pre- previously discussed, that my mind said, you can do this. So I did. I hired a world record winning paraglider as my coach, and I learned how to fly. I remember the first time I took off on my own, not tandem, and I felt the calm, serene feeling of floating in the air. I've often described that feeling as the same feeling you get in your dreams when you're flying, floating, and hovering. It's so freeing. Around that same time, I decided that it was time to stop making excuses and buy the motorcycle that I had always wanted. The first time I was on the bike riding with my visor open, feeling the wind in my face, I wondered why I had waited so long to experience this sense of freedom. Again, I didn't need to be in great shape to ride, but my mind didn't really open up to that idea until I was. That's the way it works. You don't know what it looks like or feels like on top of the mountain until you are there. Now, those of you that will tell me, but Steve, I remember this back in the day. Any glory day thinker is missing this one key factor. When you had your glory days, whether they were in high school or college, whichever days you think back to when you were lean and strong and fit and you looked tan and everybody loved you, you're forgetting that you were as dumb as a box of rocks. You didn't have life experience. You hadn't gone through challenges. You hadn't improved yourself. You didn't get married. You didn't have kids. You didn't have all of these things that you have right now. And so you've got to stop using the glory days as the excuse. You don't know what it looks like or feels like to be on top of the mountain until you're there. And that's why do I refer to this final phase as explore and experiment. You see, what's great is when you get to this point, the world becomes your oyster. You can tear your shirt off and ride a bike down the path next to the lake in Chicago. You can do pull-ups with 50 pounds around your waist just because it sounds cool. You can learn how to snowboard at the age of 30, run straight up Camelback Mountain, and then back down again just because you thought it might be interesting to count how many people you could lap along the way. There's no real limit. Psychologically, this becomes the most fun phase. Instead of being on a weight loss, weight gain treadmill, you've now unplugged from the, ma- the ma- matrix. I don't know why I couldn't get that word out. You're on a, off of the hamster wheel. You are the dad the neighbor kids call buff. You are the old guy in the gym that people look at while doing your crazy pull-ups and are amazed. You're the man that says yes to experiences in new countries you've never traveled to simply because you aren't limited by your body. You walk through towns and experience more. You hike through mountains and connect more. Board meetings now become different 
and involve surfboards, snowboards, wakeboards, and skateboards. Leadership becomes presence and process based where you can talk less, but say more because your essence moves before you. Integrity actually means something because your life is integrated. It's no longer just a theory or a concept. It's lived and your life is within you. Honesty in others comes completely, or honesty with others comes completely because you stop lying to yourself and saying you can't do something because of genetics, age, or whatever flavor of the month excuse you're using. Love becomes deeper because it outwardly flows from you and from a wellspring inside of you because you have spent a significant amount of time invested into leaning into what it really means to love yourself, to love the most important person in your life, and that's you. Investment becomes less of a one-dimensional idea and stops meaning business markets or real estate. And it takes on a life of its own because you have invested in your most valuable asset, you. You stand on mountains, lift more things, run further, see deeper, love more. And you experience all the flavor of life in this phase. You see, that's what life was meant to be. If you're on the hamster wheel, if you're constantly going through the weight loss, weight gain journey, it's probably time to get off and start to go through. Look at life as an infinite game and start to move through the different phases. And on that note, folks, it is time for us to wrap up this episode of The Evolved Man. Do me a favor, will you? Don't, take, don't forget to take 30 seconds, jump on, give us a rating on Spotify or Apple. It is the way that we get more reach for the podcast. I am Steve Cutler reminding you that it takes time and consistency to evolve. But first, you have to disrupt. And now it's time for you to get out there and evolve. Thanks for joining me today for this episode of The Evolved Man. If you're learning from and gaining value from this podcast, please subscribe to The Evolved Man newsletter, where I can support you even more in your personal evolution. I want to help you reverse engineer your success. The Evolved Man newsletter is like getting a free coaching session to keep you moving forward on your path of personal success. Go to the evolvedmanpodcast.com to sign up today. If you found value in this episode, you can give us up to a five-star rating on Apple and Spotify and share it with your network. That's the best way to support the podcast so we can continue to get great guests and provide you with the best wisdom for your daily life. Until next time, keep evolving.